Senator Stool. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. And I'd like to talk about the <coughs> National Road Safety Governance Review. So um, we know about the review because Minister McCormack has put out the uh, media statement and, and, and moved on. So can I talk about the Minister's media release? He said the review is one of 12 recommendations put forward by the independent inquiry into the National Road Safety Strategy, uh, initiated by the Australian Government, right, and will be delivered in 2019, we're told. So, have you read the National Road Safety Strategy? Who am I, who am I talking to, sorry? It's all blurry, all the name tags, I'm sorry. Um, perhaps address mm. most of your questions yep. to Pip Spence and Stephanie Werner. Yep, so, um, read the strategy, have read the inquiry report um, and the action plan, so, Senator. Okay, so has the government asked you to conduct any research on the recommend recommendations of the report? Uh, We've, um, we're working on the basis, of, we're, we're looking at all the, the recommendations. We'll be working with our Transport and Infrastructure Council colleagues to come up with a, um, ways to take forward the recommendations in parallel with um, undertaking the governance review that the, the Deputy Prime Minister has already announced will be progressing. Okay, so this, so of the 12 recommendations, this one, this one I'm just trying to clear up, so it's been moved to a, uh, a COAG, is it, is it a COAG system? Is it, I'll tell you the fear I have, is it going to be pushed off to the departments and then we'll never see it again? And it's not a political statement because I really want to know where we're no, at. No, no, Senator, not at all. Um, and in many ways, many of the issues that the, um, the inquiry was recommended be covered off in that review do touch on a number of the other recommendations that have been identified in the report itself. So it's certainly something that we, we see as being progressed as a priority um, by the department, but in consultation with states and territories and other industry representatives. So who's the, thanks Ms Spence, who's the other industry representatives that will be part of this working group? Uh, we haven't identified who would be, we haven't said there'd necessarily be a working group. Given the number of submissions that were made to the inquiry, I think it yep. be, will be um, concerned to try and limit the number of people that we've, who will be on a working group. So we just want to, we'll need to ex engage broadly, but the details of how we'll do that haven't been okay. settled yet. Okay, so it's going to go off to uh, the appropriate state ministers yeah, so the, and departments? The COAG Transport and Infrastructure Council will be the mechanism for engaging with the states and territories. Okay, and you haven't identified uh, stakeholders, other stakeholders yet, but you said there, sh there will be some stakeholders? We, we already know who have put in submissions to the inquiry, um, so there's a, there's a long list of those who have obviously already expressed an interest. Um, we heard from Senator Lionhelm previously concerns around motorcycle organisations not being adequately covered in this, so that's another group of people that we're going to need to engage with, Senator. Okay, so will the, the uh, proponents of the inquiry, Professor Woodley and Dr Crozier, be invited onto this, this group? Um, as I said, Senator, I haven't, we haven't said there's going to be a group per se. Um, it's going to be managed in the department and in got engaging with others. As I think I mentioned earlier, um, both Professor Woolley and Dr Crozier will be coming along to the Transport and Infrastructure Council to provide ministers with a direct briefing on the issues that they've identified as part of their review. So we certainly see them as being important um, stakeholders in taking forward the... Absolutely. All the hard, well, sorry, Ms Spence, what I'm trying to say, the work's all been done. It's there. We don't need it pushed off to another reviewer or another group. I, I'm not having yeah. a crack at you, but I just see the same cycle. Here we go again, you know, move it aside here, nothing to see. Yeah. Anyway, we'll move on. There'll be another election and we'll worry about it later. That's I, the feeling that I get. Yeah. I'm more, I'm more, Senator, I haven't been involved in the past, but, um, and I definitely hear your frustration, but some of the, the um, issues raised in the review, such as the Vision Zero, the elimination gender, for example, um, you know they're very sound ideas, and and the 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 um, upcoming um, sensation of the current program to 2020 does present this. This is a very good opportunity to reset the agenda post 2020. So I hear your frustration, and I, uh, and, and we're very mindful of it. But 
Um, Ms Spence is right. We are, we are um, firmly committed to working with the ministers, all, all ministers across the jurisdictions, to get this agenda moving more quickly. Okay, so thank you for that. Has the scope of the inquiry been determined? Um, no, Senator. As per the Deputy Prime Minister's um, announcement, we will be working with states and territories and other stakeholders to settle the terms of reference for the, the governance review. All right, so what are the timelines of the review then while we're on that? Um, Ms. Werner, do you want to? Uh, Senator Stephanie Werner, Acting Executive Director of Surface Transport Policy Division. So the inquiry report had recommended that the governance review being completed by March 2019. Yeah. Um, the government hasn't, hasn't announced when it expects to actually conclude the governance review. We are working to have the terms of reference for the governance review agreed as quickly as possible, but as Ms Spence did say, there will be some consultation required before we can settle the terms of reference. I think the Deputy Prime Minister's press release referred to the terms of reference being finalised by the end of the year. Um, we are trying to get them done before then, um, but certainly we would see it over the next six months being completed. Okay. So can you tell us what resources are being put in to conduct this review or allocated? Uh, Senator, we've, we will have a <coughs> dedicated team to work on the, on the, the review, um, led at a senior executive service level and um, sufficient resources to move this as quickly as we possibly can. I can't give you the exact numbers, but we're certainly committed to having a dedicated team so it doesn't get shunted to one side. Okay, I suppose, Ms Spence, the test is here that we had Professor Woolley and Dr Crozier in here in this building, ooh, uh, September 17th or somewhere, 14th, somewhere around there. Unfortunately, I was, uh, Senator O'Sullivan and I were overseas on another mission. Um, and the, the Deputy Prime Minister responded at the National Road Safety Conference week at the dinner that he was off and running. And in a joint statement here, the Deputy Prime Minister with the Shadow um, Minister and myself said we're very happy. We want to work collegiately together, definitely. Put aside the politics, this is very important. And that's all rolled and rolled on and all that sort of stuff. So I just don't want to be here at the February estimate saying we asked back then. Yeah, and, and my fears have come, here we go again, a lot of lip service, I'm not you guys, so I don't want to be back here saying, it's just history repeating itself, nothing's going to get done, so you, as you said, you see my frustration. Can you tell us where safety fits in the review? Like, will health departments and safe work bodies also be able to contribute? Uh, we will be engaging with the, the agencies that are identified in the inquiry report, which um, included those. So yes, we'll, we'll be working across the Commonwealth with the states and territories and also with industry. So that's the, the challenge with all of this. We want to bring everyone with us, but as you say, we don't want it to be take so long that you lose momentum. So No, that's right. Yeah. And, and God bless all the ministers and all that. Yeah, OK. They're all dutifully elected people and I get all that and I respect their position. But, you know, the, the, the health has to be there. Yeah. You know, all these other people, they have to be there. And you're saying to me, we don't quite know, but you agree they should be. I can't put words in your mouth. But you, when will you be able to tell us who will be part of the, the, the review? Um, we'll Hopefully this year. Hopefully yeah. this year. I, I think yeah. we'll have a much clearer picture once we've come out of the other side of the Transport Infrastructure Council meeting on the 9th of November. Yeah. Um, mm. The ministers will have an, an, an opportunity to discuss, I think Senator Gallagher mentioned the dinner they have the evening beforehand. The ministers will have an opportunity to discuss the review at the dinner. They'll get the presentation um, um, from Professor Woolley and, um, and Dr Crozier. And we'll try and get this terms of reference settled as quickly as we can for the governance review. Yep. And then um, I'm hopeful we'll kick along. But that's okay. Thanks, Dr Kennedy. And I know it's only one of 12 recommendations, but has there been any discussion about the other 11 uh, recommendations, where we're going to go, or is it just only one's been plucked? That's why I'm asking. Uh, no, Senator. We'll be using the Transport and Infrastructure Council to focus on some of those other recommendations. Again, they do require state and territory um, actions as well as ones from the Commonwealth. So, again, as Dr Kennedy said, we hope we can give you a, a 
a clearer response after the Transport and Infrastructure Council meeting. Okay. But, but just prior to the council meeting and you know, considering a way forward, then there would be, there would be uh, an amount of preparatory work being done right now. Yes. Yes. To, to properly brief the bureaucrats who brief the state ministers. Yes. Yes. Senator. So that's all in train as we speak. That's that's what we've been focusing on, Ms. Wayne. Um, I just wanted to add that, um, so we received the report on the 12th of September um, and we had the opportunity to present the report and discuss it at the Austroid Safety Task Force meeting on the 2nd of October, okay. where the Commonwealth, the States and Territories, the Local Government Association, Austroids and the NTC are all represented. We had a good conversation around the recommendations in the report that will require cooperation between the Commonwealth and the States and Territories. Um, following that meeting, we have been able to agree at a working level some of the recommendations that we may be able to progress collectively from the inquiry report. Um, but as Ms Spence said, they will be formalised by ministers on the 9th of November. So, I mean, I've been critical in the past of the department not having enough focus on road safety, but you're sort of assuring the committee that the focus has changed. You're doing preparatory work based on that completed uh, inquiry with a view to getting some policy decisions around about the 9th of November? Yes, we're absolutely working towards that goal. We've done a lot of preparatory work for the Transport and Infrastructure Council meeting. Thanks. No, so just going back to, to the actual report itself, so Professor Woolley's report um, and Dr Crozier's, can you tell us how much it cost the department in total to do that, including secretariat support? and financial support to panel members appointed to uh, undertake the inquiry? Um, I, I don't have a total figure, but I can give you the different elements. Is that appropriate? Yep. Um, so Associate Professor Woolley was paid a total fee of $11,200. Dr Crozier was paid a total fee of $17,175. The two principal advisers did not receive any fees but had travel accommodation costs covered for stakeholder meetings and meetings with the Deputy Prime Minister. The department estimates the support provided through secretariat services to the inquiry as 10% of an EL2, 30% of an EL1 and 20% of an <coughs> APS6 officer. I think you've provided that on notice of a $77,000. That's correct. So we're looking at 77 plus 30. Less yes. than 100,000. That was for the departmental component, yes. Mm. Okay. And then there was the advisors and the travel and accommodation. So has the department got the appropriate structures and resourcing and budget to be able to meet its obligations in road safety as we stand at the moment? But I uh, do think we, as uh, Ms Spence um, was outlining, um, uh, need to build um, a higher level targeted capability to get this get this going. Um, it's Ms. Bent's outlined that we'll be looking to um, put a, a senior executive, people who attend at this table, uh, senior executive service officer specifically in charge of just road safety, um, with a Switch small with okay. a with a small just a small team because as as you know, Senator, a lot of this work is. Um, one of the senators used this earlier, herding cats or cajoling mm. people to get their things organised. There's some, as Ms Werner just outlined, some very good work going on inside Austros um, and other places, but we need to bring it all together and it all needs to sit against a post-2020 strategy and that's what the team, that team would be focused on. And can I just say for the record too, I think you could pay Professor Woolley and Dr Crozier 20 times what they got paid and still wouldn't be what they're worth. I just want to get that on the, on the record. Well, to put it another way, the sum that this inquiry's uh, sort of eaten up of taxpayers' money is probably less than the budget that you have to attend international conferences in Copenhagen and the like. Well, I can put on the record I've never attended an international conference in, in my current role, but I take your points, Senator. But several members of your department and the NTC have, and we know that one who finishes next Monday oh. <laughs> wandered away for a soiree in Copenhagen. It's We'll get that I'm money on notice. Yeah, yeah, for the pub show. Let's just stick to the screen. Don't All right, now just move on to vehicle safety standards. Um, uh, the European Commission is progressing with what they call the General Safety Regulation and Pedestrian Safety Regulation, which seek to introduce a package of vehicle standards including mandatory autonomous emergency braking. This should fire you up, Senator Gallagher. Mandatory drowsiness, 
mandatory drowsiness, that comes naturally. And attention detection, this is sound like a party room meeting for some people. And mandatory lane keeping assist as well as other technologies. Sorry, it's getting late. Um, this is serious. Okay, so is the U if the Europeans can introduce such mandatory vehicle standards in their market, what is preventing Australia from moving ahead and introducing more stringent vehicle safety standards in our market? Because as Senator O'Sullivan, Senator Gallagher and myself found out in the safety, road safety inquiry in the references committee, we dumb cars down to bring them into this nation. So those specific... Um, Just introduce yourself. Sorry, sorry Sharon Nyakwengama, General Manager, Vehicle Safety Standards. Um, so the exact question about what, what are we doing? We're, we're pursuing... Um, sorry, I threw you off by yeah. stating the bleeding obvious that we dumb cars down to bring them into this nation. How come the Europeans are smarter than us? Where is our will to make these damn cars safe on our roads? Why do we have to sit back and wait for America and Europe? Why do we have to have 1,200 people killed on our roads every year? This is what I'm trying to get to. So I want to know why we are so poor when it comes to other standards around the world in so road safety. The, the ADR, and vehicles. the Australian design rules, the ADRs are broadly comparable to those of all other development nations. And different differences in the timing and the scope vary due to a range of factors such as various countries' priorities, um, road safety issues and fleets, and the market characteristics. Australia actually leads on a number of, uh, of vehicle standards which and follows ones? on yeah, another. I was going to say, can you tell but, us which but ones? But no country leads on all. So, now you, can you tell uh, us which ones we lead on? We, we and lead don't, on. please don't compare to Southeast Asia or Africa or no, something. Uh, Australia certainly um, leads on, um, on uh, child restraint uh, work. We, we had uh, more advanced child restraint standards prior to other countries. We led the world um, development of the global regulation on pole side impact, which is now a mandatory standard in all light vehicles in Australia. Um, we, we led the development Sorry, of that, was that UN regulation. Sorry, what second one? Sorry, pole side impact. Pole side. Pole side impact. Um, Australia's bus passengers, um, bus standards for occupant safe, safety lead the world. Let's get um, back, sorry, <laughs> let's get back to cars where we, we, okay, try and pride ourselves on, oh, aren't we fantastic because we should talk about mandating four star. Talking about it, we can't even have the guts to say we're going to mandate five star. Cars aren't built in this nation. 1.1 million we import every year, and yet we have to wait for the Europeans and the Americans, and then when they go ahead and do it, we say, oh no, take it out. Oh, well, we don't need to go that. That's serious. Why would we want an autonomous emergency braking as a, as a, a mandatory standard in Australian vehicles? Let's just keep yeah. running people over. Yeah. Autonomous emergency braking um, is on our work program at the moment under the under the current uh, the 2018-2020 national um, road safety action plan. So, what um, does your work <coughs> program mean? Is it something that you'll Sorry? talk about at the next conference? Uh, no, is no. Is that what you're saying? We're, we are you... actively doing work on on automated emergency braking. We currently have commissioned research by MUARC, the Monash University Accident Research Centre. The, the policy um, of the coalition was to have it mandated by 2018. It was the policy uh, platform that was put out in that nice little blue document Senator, after a report from Bitter. Sorry, Senator, if I could just um, jump in and say, as we've explained previously, without the international... Um, standard or UN standard, it makes it very difficult for us. But one of the um, things that we have found out is um, ANCAP has now advised that 31% of new cars um, sold in Australia now offer this offer AEB as a feature. Yeah, but Ms Spence, I'm not interested in what people might want to pay for. For the sake of what it would cost, a four-year loan for a new car, it's about four or five dollars, I'm told. Are That's we expensive. serious that the government can't even come out and say, don't, it's not an option? We want these cars safe, not only for the driver, but in case you pull out and some poor bugger on a push bike coming down the main drag. This is what we're talking about. It's all very well to say, oh, aren't we fantastic, because some of them do provide it. I'm talking about mandatory standards here, lifting the standards. Australia is behind. So when you talk about your work diaries or your work programs, is it a wish list? I'm not having a crack at you. It's the government that needs to step up to the plate for crying out loud and do everything they can to make at least at least make it mandatory to have these features that are already available through the US and Europe. So, so perhaps I can just add some colour to Senator Stirl's I don't assertion. think that would be possible. We know from a careful evaluation of the introduction of road, road safety initiatives like seatbelts that it took nearly 11 years to gain 
uh, legislation in every jurisdiction. There's un, you know, the number of people killed in that 11 years is unbelievable. We know there's <coughs> autonomous emergency braking, lane keep assist, and all of these things which are uh, freely available in very uh, economical cars, like the Toyota imported into Australia now for $22,000 is almost the safest car in the world. Mm. We know these things. Are we going to have to wait another 11 years for the ADRs, which have held us back from putting in place proven technologies, a la seatbelts, are we going to have to wait another 11 years before the department and or the government of the day start saving lives? Canada, I'm, I'm, I'm loathe yeah. your comment. But I, I want to answer on the legislation. No, no, but the, wit the witness can't, the, the officials can't <coughs> answer your question. What they, well, no, I'm sorry. How long they, has the Australian design rules take to change? What, what, well, that's a, que that's a good question for them. How long did the Australian and design rules take to change for autonomous emergency braking? Um, do, can I just give you a, a, a more detail on our what current work program and what yeah, we're doing in relation to autonomous now. What AEB. Right. So AEB is in, in the, is in the current national um, road safety action plan for 2018 to 2020. It's our priority um, ADR that we're working on. We have commissioned work uh, data on um, from UARC at the moment to inform a regulatory impact statement, uh, which and that that. For, we're leading with um, heavy vehicles because there is currently a UN, an international standard for AEB for heavy vehicles, which we can adopt as part of our harmonisation program. But we still have to make the case uh, through a regulatory impact assessment process that um, the cost, the, the benefit outweighs the cost. So, so is there a time frame on all yes, of this? Yes. Uh, so the, we'll have the results for that first round, uh, tranche of research by the end of this this year, this calendar year which will inform a regulation impact statement, which we will consult on in the first half of 2019. And, so, and when will that be completed? Sorry, we will consult on the regulation impact statement in, yeah, early, and, in the first half of 2019. So using the seatbelts as an analogy, is it going to take 11 years to, or less yeah. to do this? It will be less. I would hope that by the end of 2019, we have, a, a, have an ADR in place for automated emergency braking for heavy vehicles. For and heavy will, vehicles? Yes. yes. What about pedestrians? Uh, what right. about so children? For light what about cyclists? Right, so for light vehicles, um, there is no, currently no international regulation. There is no standard developed for us to adopt. Okay, um, and, and that's so, true. But yes. the American market accepted the proposition that if you want regulation, we'll give it to you. <coughs> so you better get as manufacturers in front of the curve, and they have done that. Toyota do not sell a car in America without AEB. Yes, but uh, some statistics... So why are we so slow on this? Right. Some statistics provided to me by ANCAP this morning indicate that America has reached 20% of new cars through their program, through, mm. through that voluntary agreement to include AEB. We've reached 31% of new cars through our ANCAP program. Importantly, manufacturers took it upon themselves to not make a car that didn't have it. Yes. So if you're not going to regulate... Hmm. then they need to make a decision. The regulation's coming, let's get in front of the curve. I don't get any confidence that we're not going to have the same disasters we had with seatbelts. 11 years hmm. before every jurisdiction put a seatbelt in. Hmm. And we have similar type silver bullet technology and we're not in front of it. Senator, our, our, our aim is to have, at the end of the, current, of the current National Road Safety Action Plan, have to have completed the work for ADRs for both, uh, a new ADR for both heavy vehicle emergency, uh, automated emergency braking and light vehicle <coughs> automated emergency braking. We're, we're joining, we're explain participating to me, in... Explain to me why we need an Australian design rule for a car that's, that's made overseas, mm. right? Well, we're not making cars anymore. Yes. The work has been done overseas to say this technology is safe and it works. Huge global manufacturers are doing it. And here we are, we're doing an ADR on it. We still have to make a minimum standard for entry to the Australian market, Senator. I want a maximum standard, not a minimum standard. Well, the standards are minimum standards. So, we... Back to this, uh, if we can, send us a story.